Okay, so we looked at, uh, we were interested in LIBOR because LIBOR is the benchmark, uh, the default benchmark for floating rate issuance. Okay, and so, and LIBOR is the, here I'm writing YTM, uh, just, just to avoid having to write a big word like yield. Okay, I'm going to make it even better and make it only, I'm going to now, if I say, if I use the, if you, if I use this uh, symbol percentage, that means I'm referring to an interest rate. Okay. It's a white, it could be either a YTM or it could be a yield on a deposit. So normally as a market convention in finance, we don't use the word YTM for money market instruments. Okay, we just say yield, but I'm just using it because I'm using shorthand, but I'll just use the percentage sign. That means I'm referring to an interest rate. It could be a money market deposit yield. So here we use the word yield. We don't use the word YTM. YTM is something we reserve for coupon paying bonds. Okay, for bond market instruments which have coupons. That is strictly speaking, when you're talking to people in the market, you should not use YTM for money market uh, securities. We just use the word yield. But I'm just going to use percentage now for everything. Yield on deposits, YTM, everything. <coughs> just for shortcuts. Okay, so we want to extend and obviously this is the uh, LIBOR is the uh, yield on Euro dollar deposits. Okay, strictly speaking, it is USD LIBOR is the yield on euro dollar deposits actually this is a euro deposit but this is because it's us dollars so we say euro dollar if it's a yen deposit we say euro yen okay so uh, now then what we were looking at the reason we got interested in the interest rate swap curve okay and notice that even in the last class i have referred to i have used expressions like uh, irs uh, yeah okay i have used these expressions so this is the expression Again, I should not uh, use the word euro dollar here. Um, okay, it's a euro deposit yield curve that is more important. Okay, so uh, what we were looking at, why did we look at the IRS uh, yield curve? We looked at it because it is the equivalent of the uh, euro deposit yield curve for maturities longer than 12 months. Okay, because deposits are from money market securities, so therefore they are only up to 12 months. Okay, so if you want to go beyond 12 months for the same grade of credit, which you saw in that particular instance, that we looked at, uh, so was it page seven? Yeah, this is even that is too. Yeah, we looked at the situation here, which, uh, all right, you can see this. We looked at the situation where this company ABC initially has a floating rate loan and then it wants to manage the risk. It does not want to remain exposed to floating rate LIBOR, uh, to six month LIBOR, and therefore it enters into an IRS. And this is the IRS. This transaction is the IRS. All right, I should not point with my fingers, but with this. So this transaction is the IRS where they're swapping the fixed cash flow with the floating cash flow and because you're able to exchange uh, if you're because you're able to uh, you know receive six month LIBOR flat against a 6.38 fixed rate we say that this is the IRS rate okay this is the IRS rate for five years in this example okay so therefore this is uh, that's why we are saying that effectively this becomes this is the point we were discussing I think in the last part of this class of the previous class that why do we say this is an important point to understand that this we have a particular interest in the double a rated credit curve okay uh, we have a particular interest in the uh, interest in the uh, in the yield curve for double a rated credits why do we have this particular interest because it's uh, you know when there are so many different classes of ratings triple a triple b and all that why are we so interested in double a credits because double uh, a credits is essentially what you see in the libor uh, in the in the libor yield curve right and because most of the floating rate issuance in the world happens against LIBOR. Are you following what I'm saying? Why are we so interested in the, in the, in the yield curve for AA rated credits? Remember for every type of credit, there's a different yield curve because you saw that chart of different credit spreads. Okay. For any get, when you change the category of credits, you remember all these credit ratings that you have. Further up, we have given you the list of credit ratings, right? So we have a particular interest in, interest in the AA rated credit, in the yield curve for AA rated credits because the LIBOR rate, okay, is the uh, yield curve for AA rated credits in the money markets because LIBOR will only run from one month to 12 months, okay? So therefore the LIBOR is so, and why are we so interested in LIBOR? Because 
most of the floating rate issuance in the capital markets, global capital markets, it happens against LIBOR as a benchmark. Okay, so some people price at 75 basis points over LIBOR. Some people may very good quality credits may actually be able to price below LIBOR. Okay, but the reference is always LIBOR. It's not the government bond uh, benchmark. Is this important point clear? In the bond markets, the reference is the government bond benchmark. Okay, but in the in the uh, floating rate uh, uh, debt, whenever you're using fl issuing floating rate debt, the default benchmark is LIBOR. That's why we have a particular interest in the uh, and LIBOR reflects a double A credit risk. Okay, and so therefore we have a special interest in the but in the yield curve for double A rated credits. Okay, and then we have also because most companies will have similar concerns if they issue five year debt at LIBOR, they may not want to remain exposed to floating rate interest rates floating rate uh, risk for five years so they may have a particular interest in moving into uh, effectively hedging their uh, and effectively getting a net cost of debt which is fixed so removing the risk as you can see here the six month LIBOR will cancel out you can see that yeah everyone can see that the six month LIBOR cancels out as Guy pointed out yesterday the net rate is 6.38 so many companies have an interest in this and the way you achieve this is through the interest rate swap market and this is the interest rate swap transaction the most basic type of interest rate derivative product okay so therefore we have a particular interest and, and the so what we say here is what we discussed i'm just recapping here the last part of the previous class that uh the irs rate is the equivalent of the libor rate for maturities beyond 12 months is this point clear to everyone because you're able to exchange here what is the company doing they're exchanging the irs rate for libor flat six month libor in this example you can take a different rate there'll be a very, only a few basis points difference if you did it against three month libor okay but the point is the point to understand is that they're able to exchange a flat libor flow a flat libor cash flow here this means that every six months every six months what will happen is they'll find out what what does this transaction mean Every six months, they're going to find out what was the fixing for six month LIBOR, like six months ago. Remember that LIBOR is set in advance and paid at the back end, just like your bank fixed deposits. If you invest in a one year fixed deposits with uh, fixed deposit with the Yes Bank, okay, then what happens is you invest today for one year, right? And they tell you the rate today itself. Suppose it's seven and a half percent. So they let you know today itself that the rate you're going to get is seven and a half percent, but the interest is paid to you at the end of one year okay right now of course they have quarterly compounding and all that but let's forget all that but let's assume that it didn't that didn't exist they would pay you the rate at the end of one year at the end of one year you get your p plus i back is everyone clear okay so the point is for most money market instruments uh, your setting is going to be uh, you know uh, at the front end and the payment is going to be at the back end so this is not a new concept you know how bank fixed deposits work so the interest rate is declared to you at the beginning so the rate is determined at the beginning but the cash flow is paid at the end okay so every six months they will figure out what the six month LIBOR fixing is and six months from that date they will have to exchange cash flows this SCB will pay six uh, SCB will receive 6.38 percent fixed and ABC will receive whatever the six month LIBOR fixing was six months ago is everyone clear about this this is how the system works okay and they will just because this is a pure interest rate swap so this business will go on it's a five-year transaction so it will go on for five years after five years it will stop okay so every every six months they will exchange cash flows in fact what happens is they will find out who owes who money <coughs> there won't be a gross exchange of cash flows there will be only a net exchange so if they find that uh, the first payment date on the first payment date if they find that the effective uh, the relevant six month LIBOR rate is five percent okay and the fixed rate is 6.38 percent in that case what will happen is abc will pay 1.38 percent to scb is everyone clear because the libor rate was fixed at five percent six months ago so when we come to the actual payment date the first payment date we find that uh, abc owes five percent sorry abc is entitled to five percent okay from scb and uh, it owes 6.38 percent so here we say that there is a net uh, payment due from abc to scb of 1.38 is everyone clear about this okay so that will that is actually how it will operate in the markets that abc will make a 1.38 percent payment okay for to the to scb okay and obviously when you do an interest rate swap you also have to fix the 
uh, notion of what is called the notion of principle. So typically what will happen if this, if this transaction is a perfect hedge. We are looking at this as the hedging situation. Is this clear? Now what have I said here in the example that I have given, I must have mentioned, uh, huh, this is, see 100 million, okay, this NPA stands for notional principal amount, you can see it will be defined earlier in the book, okay, so obviously any kind of interest payment, this is common sense, okay, no interest rate payment can be actually when you have to make the interest rate payment, you will obviously have to know what the principal amount is, can you ever calculate an interest liability without principal amount? No right you can't so you always need to know if you have to find figure out your interest liability you will always have to ask this question okay what is the principal amount right so when you do an irs you will also have to specify what is the principal amount on which this applies okay so now if this transaction is to be a perfect hedge we assume that they have issued 100 million dollars worth of frns okay they have an frn for 100 they have an frn liability for that's how it will be a perfect hedge so if they have a hundred million dollar FRN liability here, okay, so every six months they have to pay six month LIBOR on hundred million dollars. Now they've also done an IRS for hundred million dollars. So therefore the six month total liability on the six month LIBOR legs will cancel out perfectly. Is this clear? That is why, that is if you want to make this as a, if you want to structure this as a perfect hedge. But as we discovered in, in any kind of uh, active or dynamic hedging program, it is the discretion of the corporate treasury as to how much you want to hedge. You may have a loan liability for $100 million, but you may decide to hedge only for $50 million or $25 million because you might feel that here what you're doing is you are paying the uh, fixed rate, okay, paying the swap rate, okay, so you're paying on the swap. So therefore, if you, if you let's say as a treasury, as a corporate treasury, okay, uh, if you issued a FRN for $100 million, and you did an IRS only for say $25 million, okay? Then what can I assume about your view on IRS rates? Is my question clear? Do you think that, uh, uh, are you of the view that IRS rates are going to come down or they are going to go up? Remember IRS rates are just a, a, the, an instrument that is trading. It is something that you can enter into. So, yeah. Is my question clear to you? Okay, if he thinks the question is clear, let me go ahead. So, if we are hedging uh, twenty-five million dollars, that is one fourth of four hundred million dollars. So, we are of the bullish view that the IRS is going to rise. Okay. Well, okay. Let me clear for the rest of the people uh, question. So, he has understood the question. Okay. Uh, now, the question because, is: uh, If we are uh, hedging only one fourth part, because if we hedge. Yeah, I got your point. I got what you said. At least what is clear is that you have understood the question. The question is, if I see a corporate treasury which, had is, which has issued a FRN for $100 million, they have raised $100 million, okay? Now you're changing your answer. Okay. So, good that you've actually picked up on the question. Uh, and so, the question that I was asking is, if I observe that a corporate treasury which has issued FRNs of $100 million, they have raised $100 million of capital, okay, through an FRN and but, but they are exposed that obviously the FRN is against a floating rate, but they are of the view that interest rates, uh, there is a long term risk of uh, interest rates rising. But in the short term, if they do only, if they hedge only 25% uh, of that liability through an IRS, they only do an IRS for $25 million. What does that say about their, uh, at least their short term view about uh, interest rates, okay, about the IRS rate? And so that was the question. Is the question clear now? Yes, sir. Okay, so is Sahil question is still not clear? Yes or no? Question is not clear. Okay, why don't you come and sit next to Nimish? That will be a little clearer. That will also leave Achal some without anybody to talk to. That is good. Okay, I know, but come here, come, come, come and sit next. Let's let's pack up the front benches. <laughs> No, that's why you need to come here. So, okay, but that's okay. Come and sit next to Nimesh anyway. I want to pack the front benches. Come, come, come. No, 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 it's not fine there. Don't worry. Otherwise, you'll face a fine on your CP points. Come here. Come, come. Don't waste my time. Okay. So, is the question clear to everyone? Is the question clear now? Yes, sir. To everyone? That if I see, bell is still not clear. The question is, if I see that a corporate treasury which has a hundred million dollar liability 
okay on an frn okay floating rate liability and overall the macro view is that they would like to hedge okay but tactically speaking they have hedged only 25 percent so in the short term what what can i infer if i see them doing this okay i observe their actions these are their actions now what can i infer about their view on irs rates remember irs rates if you can uh, if i can actually try and show you something here uh, the irs rates uh, yeah this is like okay so you see here this is a chart uh, from the again the st louis fed thing uh website so you can see here the five year swap rates is good it fits our example okay irs rates tend to move with the treasury rates more or less okay theoretically the irs rate should be higher or lower than the treasury rate theoretically the irs rate should be higher or lower higher. <coughs> some are saying higher some are saying lower giri answered this question Giri answered this question when I asked him about the TED spread. In the TED spread, the euro dollar euro dollar yield is supposed to be higher or lower than the uh, Treasury bill yield. You forgot in TED spread. The lower. What is lower? The swap rate is lower or the Treasury rate is lower? Swap rate. Okay, let's get this clear, guys. Your logic is not working. You're you're not thinking logically. As I said, Giri already explained it when I asked about the TED spread. The TED spread is typically a money market phenomenon. Okay, because we've got the euro dollar there. Okay, so there is a U.S. dollar based discussion. Okay, so uh, the TED spread is the spread between euro dollar deposits and the Treasury uh, bill yield. Okay, so here the TED spread we deduct. We calculate the TED spread by deducting the treasury bill yield from the TED spread we have already done this calculation in your uh, uh, here under TED we did this three month LIBOR we find out three month LIBOR is four and a half percent we find the three month T bill is all right three month T bill is 3.75 so the TED spread is 0.75 because 3.4.5 minus 3.75 okay so normally our theoretical expectation is that LIBOR should be the LIBOR yield should be higher than the T-bill yield because the T-bill is considered risk-free so you can take it as AAA or even better than AAA if possible okay whereas LIBOR reflects what grade of credit risk AA okay so it is necessarily worse than AAA okay so therefore if the grade of credit is uh, worse than the AAA if worse than the treasury bill yield then the return that means the risk is higher the grade of credit is worse that means the risk the credit risk is higher so therefore risk and return go together so the market should expect a higher return from that so therefore it, theoretically the euro dollar deposit yield should be higher than the u.s treasury three month treasury bill yield. okay all right so now therefore if we as i said and one more thing we have discussed already whether you've understood it or not but we've made this statement many times in the class that the irs yield curve which is nothing but irs yield curve is nothing but if you just plot the different irs prices <coughs> where did we go to that was i think page 13. yeah irs yield curve is nothing but this once you get the swap rate this last column this is the irs yield curve okay the irs yield curve means any kind of yield curve means it's a plot of interest rates for different maturities okay if you take a standard definition of yield curve we it's just a plot of interest rates for different maturities so here we have the different maturities on the uh, x-axis okay and then on the y-axis we have the uh, interest rate uh, irs rates we have the irs rates so if we plot these irs rates against these maturities we get the irs yield curve okay so in practice in the market you'll find that although the actual term should be uh, irs yield curve people will just drop the yield part and they'll just say irs curve so if people and i've also done that sometimes in the class so if i say irs curve actually what i'm referring to is the irs yield curve okay similarly if i say if if i refer to the euro deposit curve or the euro dollar curve okay i'm actually referring to the euro dollar deposit yield curve that is plot of euro dollar deposit rates for different maturities but people tend to drop the word yield and just say call it the euro dollar curve okay so if you take since the irs and as you saw from that example on page seven that 
if you saw from that example on page 7 that the uh, IRS rate okay because the IRS rates are always quoted against if you go back to that page on page on, on page 13 that uh, that IRS curve that we saw those uh, fixed rates that are quoted on the last in the last column right those fixed rates are all quoted against these fixed rates that you see here okay these fixed rates that you're seeing here being quoted the swap rates these these are all being quoted against three month LIBOR flat okay these are all by default quoted against three month LIBOR flat so when you see these IRS rates being displayed in the market what it's actually telling you is that if you want to swap if you want to enter into an interest rate swap for let's say five years okay you are uh, you can do that approximately let's take the mid price okay 564 let's say 562 the rate is at 5.62% you can switch you can swap 5.62% with three month LIBOR okay is this clear to everyone this is what it means this is what the IRS curve is telling you that this is if you want to enter into interest rate swap for five years it's approximately 5.62% against three month LIBOR so you can these are that means if, if this is the price that means this is the equivalent that's why I say that the IRS curve is the equivalent of the euro deposit curve beyond 12 months okay this is important to understand because this curve which reflects the credit risk of what grade of credit risk <coughs> again question is not clear see if we are saying that I can exchange for five years I can exchange the IRS rate for five years against a uh, three-month LIBOR if I can exchange it then is it not okay to say that the IRS rate is the five-year the five-year IRS rate is the equivalent of the th of three-month LIBOR for five years yes. Yes. otherwise how am I able to exchange it in the market okay the market price means this is equivalent right just like when you buy gold at thirteen hundred do dollars per troy ounce which means one ounce of gold according to the market one troy ounce of gold is equivalent to thirteen hundred dollars the market is able willing to exchange it so therefore we can say that one troy ounce of gold is equivalent to thirteen hundred dollars at this current price is this clear okay so if we see any exchange the market is willing to exchange one asset for the other so we can say the one these are equivalents okay so therefore we are able to say that the irs rate for any maturity is the equivalent of the libor rate for that maturity because the irs rate is being exchanged against three month libor strictly speaking we should say three month libor because that's against that's the maturity for which it is quoted is this clear to everyone yes. okay so that's important to understand because as i said this this and this entire curve so if you construct this curve where you have uh, euro dollar deposits initially for the first 12 months <coughs> euro dollar deposit rates and then beyond 12 months you take this price set here two years three years five year ten year up to ten years you take the rate the mid rates from here and then you plot the irs curve okay so you've got one continuous yield curve are you following you've got one continuous yield curve up to 12 months these are the euro dollar deposit yields and then beyond 12 months these are the irs rates is everyone clear what half the people are dead <laughs> even in the first class are you following kaneka i don't think you're following your expression says you're not following but you're nodding your head okay so try to understand this because you're able to so the first law point is essentially that the the irs rate is the equivalent of the of the three month libor rate because you can exchange the irs rate for three month libor as in the transaction that you saw here as you saw here okay on page seven here is six month libor we'll assume that three month libor versus six month libor there's no margin okay uh, so since you are able to exchange it as the equivalent rate okay so we are spending a lot of time on this but you make sure you understand this concept because it's important for understanding uh, the floating rate debt markets and how they interact with the swap markets okay this is the important point to understand here that how they're interacting with the swap market now uh, so this is the equivalent of therefore you can construct this uh, you can construct a complete uh, yield curve for double a rated credits I hope you guys are following yes. half of them are looking down I don't know what you guys are looking at okay so you can construct a uh, you can construct a, uh, a yield curve for double a rated credits by taking in the first part you take the euro dollar deposit yields for in US dollars you take the euro dollar deposit yields for three uh, one month to from or uh, to 12 months 
and then beyond that you take the IRS rates because the IRS rates are the equivalent of the three month life of the LIBOR rates right okay so therefore you can take and you can construct this entire double A rated credit spread uh, yield curve for double A rated credits okay to understand this is important to understand because this is a important benchmark for debt uh, for floating rate debt pricing and then you can see how it connects to risk management also you can see the connection to risk management here okay so this is an important point to understand here that this is a fixed floating uh, this is called a fixed floating irs okay now there's one more point that we discussed briefly we, uh, in the last class okay which is that why is so far we are following what we are saying we are just recapping stuff i think i'm spending too much time recapping stuff but i see such blank expressions that you know uh, I, I it makes me want to recap stuff okay um, so the other thing that we discussed was why if if abc is interested in fixed rate debt if they don't want to have floating rate debt why should they bother to even go through the frn market okay and catch their year like this instead if you wanted fixed rate debt why not go straight into the fixed rate debt markets and issue fixed rate debt is this is this clear this is a legitimate question okay so this is what happens is that this is there's a concept of uh, there's a new another concept that you need to be aware of that there is this is a concept of okay okay so we are looking why did abc here not issue fixed rate debt directly okay so refer this again okay okay instead of um, issuing an FRN and then paying on an IRS. As I told you earlier, paying on an IRS means this market lingo is like this. Paying on an IRS automatically means that you're paying a fixed rate. You're paying the fixed rate because in an IRS, one party pays the fixed rate, one party pays the floating rate okay so when we say in the market lingo when we say abc is paying on an irs it is understood as abc paying the fixed rate on the irs okay and we say that scb is receiving on the irs which means scb is receiving the fixed rate okay so these are all shortcuts that are that are this is just lingo this is just jargon that is used in the market but you need to know that okay then uh, that uh, and then paying on an irs okay there is this concept of so this brings us to the concept of important concept that you need to be aware of i'll give you an article also about about this written many years ago in 1987 shows you how developed the markets were even then this is the concept of swap swap driven issuance which is very common in the international capital markets so you need to be aware of this concept now the reason this happens is we will just use it with respect to we are not going to complicate the example and go into uh, a cross currency irs we will just take it the reason this you have the swap driven issues now if typically if we assume that these two transactions happen at the same time the issuance of the frn and the entering into the swap into the irs if these two transactions happen at the same time pretty much on the same day okay within a few hours okay uh, once you finalize the uh, once you finalize the frn pricing okay immediately you enter into the irs okay if we ass assume that they happen at the same time what does that mean it means that uh, oh sorry uh, in between i missed i forgot to uh, uh, clarify further on uh, gaba's question right when i looked at him i remembered that uh, i'm just going to interrupt this discussion briefly uh, and 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 uh, go into that that earlier question that we asked you right what does that say about the um, but nobody interrupted me because I got lost in some other discussion and then I wavered from there. But I asked you about so Gaba's answer is correct. The second answer you gave was correct. Okay, so he had a bearish view because we saw that the uh, FRN issuance was for 100 million, but the hedge that they entered into was only for 25 million. Okay, and what does that say about their short term tactical view on IRS rates? So, the second answer is correct, it's bearish because the reason they're not locking into the entire 100 million of the exposure remember the underlying position is 100 million and the hedge position is only 25 million so 75% still unhedged okay 
which means that tactical short term view is that this 6.38 is going to get better right if the rates are going to fall and then we'll enter into the balance part of it okay the balance 75 percent so it's clear so good very good that you were able to quickly catch the question also on the second answer it was correct okay so um now um uh, so that so just a brief uh, recap of that okay now coming back to this now i've forgotten what i was saying here okay swap driven issuance now we are yeah yeah so why we are coming into this question of we are trying to understand this important term called swap driven issuance which is an important feature of capital markets so it will help you to understand how swaps are connected to uh, uh to capital market issuance okay all right so uh now let's look at uh, yeah sir the uh, answer can be uh, to this question that uh, why this company instead of uh, uh, issuing uh, uh, floating rate note is not directly uh, issuing uh, interest rate swap so no 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 you can't issue an interest rate swap interest rate swap is a hedging product you have to issue you have what you have to say there is instead of an irs you have to say fixed rate bond why instead of issuing an FRN, why did the why did they not directly issue which is what my question is right why did they not issue fixed rate debt directly you don't say you don't issue an irs because there's no principal payment in an irs okay these are all interest rate swap only interest flows are being exchanged okay yeah go ahead uh, so the answer uh, so okay one sec uh, bola can you take uh, prachi's phone and bring it here let's keep her so that she can concentrate on the class Bring it here quickly. <laughs> or you give it to Ishan, let him come and put it here. Quickly, quickly, let's get all this done here quickly. <laughs> put it here. Somebody come and put it here. Okay, you pass it here. Just put it here. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, uh, please concentrate. I want to see people. I want to see everybody's face looking at me, not looking at uh, your phone. As it is, you guys, are, I don't know what your problem is. Maybe you're not interested in the subject. But if you don't even make an effort to look here and try to understand what is being done, then the whole point is, the I mean, the whole exercise is a waste of time. Why are you paying so much money? You could have used this money to go and set up a business instead of wasting your money and paying money to come to a class and then you sit and do what in the class. Okay. So what's the point? It's a waste of time. You come from business families. You should understand the concept of Paisa Vasul. You're coming here and you're wasting your money. Maybe it's not your money, but your dad's money is also your money. Right. So, okay. Okay, guys, let's try and make an effort and engage uh, with what is being discussed. Important concept of swap driven issuance. Okay, what is swap driven issuance? Why did this why did this company have to go and catch its ear like this by issuing first issuing floating rate debt and then swapping into fixed rate debt through an IRS? Okay, when it all it wanted was fixed rate debt because the investor markets, uh, the investor, remember the most important mar person in this whole cap primary capital markets business is the investor okay so here this floating rate lender this is the investor class okay this is the most important market so uh, this is the most important person so there are three players there's the investment bank the pcm division of the investment bank the issuer and the investor okay so in this equation the most important person is the investor okay he determines he is the customer the customer is king so everything has to be tailored for him because there's no dearth of people who want to borrow money everybody wants to borrow money so it's the person who's lending money who is the king okay so therefore what might happen is that you might have there are some imperfections in the debt markets okay because of which uh they the you know you know for instance those who invest in bonds okay those who are institutional investors typically the investor class will be in institutional investors and pension funds okay so do you think they are more likely to be traditional asset managers or alternative asset managers yes is my question clear these types of investors that is the bond fund managers okay bond fund managers like pimco and all these people okay a big bond fund janus fidelity so these are likely to be uh, these bond fund managers and the pension fund managers okay these are likely to be traditional asset managers or alternative asset managers alternative. Not well, it is strikes to some extent it's true with pension fund managers today, but these are traditionally uh, these are by historically these are all traditional asset managers. They invest only in stocks and bonds, they have all kinds of restrictions, they can't invest in derivatives. Okay, 
so understand this that the typical bond investor the typical bond investor is a uh, traditional asset manager the typical bond investor is a mutual fund manager who invests in debt and equity so there will be the debt part part of the so hdfc mutual fund might have a debt fund as well but those guys are not allowed to go short they are not allowed to use derivatives they are just allowed to buy bonds and then uh, be net long bonds or net zero max they can't go net short remember all the distinctions between tam and am okay just have to copy the index they don't have to copy the index that is only if they are passive so but they could be active managers tam majority of the managers are passive not not necessarily so there is a drift towards passive management in tam that is happening but it's still you can't say that it's all tam uh, it's all passive there are active managers as well so all of tam is not passive but all we discussed was that there is a shift of money within tam there is a shift of money from active management to passive management but that does not mean that the shift is 100% over okay so it's not that active managers are zero there are many active managers still okay so so the point to understand is why do we have this kind of uh, swap driven issuance this is called swap driven issuance if it happens on the same day okay what happens is because the uh, say let's say traditional debt investors okay uh, traditional debt investors have many restrictions okay on where and how how they invest okay all right so uh, this may mean for instance in this example okay uh, so in this example this may mean that when they when see remember what how a debt issue is managed so abc says that i want to issue i need 100 million dollars of funding for 5 years so abc tells the origination team of the investment bank that the remember all these concepts which we are using which we are recapping okay so abc will be the issuer okay they will be contact in touch with the origination team okay within the pcm unit of the investment bank okay please make sure that you guys uh, are all paying attention and using this opportunity to recap all these all these concepts so issuer abc will be contacted by the origination team right within the pcm unit of the investment bank and the P origination team is also in touch with the distribution team they are in touch with us part of the same organization same unit so the distribution team tells them that when we talk to investors we don't find any demand for i'm just giving an extreme example but we don't find any in any demand for five year fixed rate us dollar debt so investors are not interested in investors are not interested in buying fixed rate us dollar debt for five years are you following this is just investor preference just like people did not want to buy netbooks smartphones came up and so people rejected netbooks and netbook manufacturers suffered a big loss because everybody started buying smartphones this is just user cuz customer preferences have suddenly shifted okay so the customer the fixed rate investor the debt investors to whom everything has to be sold they are the customer they are the king and we look at customer preferences and the distribution guys talking to the customers to the investors they find that there is no demand for five year fixed rate dollar debt is this point clear this can happen this is just a market situation that the customers want to buy smartphone they are not interested in netbooks okay is this clear to so the market situation but then the customer then the you see how an irs can be used to satisfy both ends on the one end you have the issuer on the one hand you have the investor and the investment bank is in between okay and how we use an irs to satisfy both sides okay but obviously the customer is the investment the main uh, king is the investor the investor does not want fixed rate dollar debt he wants floating rate dollar debt maybe the investors have a view that interest rates short term interest rates are going to rise so they want to invest in floating rate dollar debt are you following the logic yes. if investors are of the view that short term interest rates are going to rise then they would prefer to in invest in short uh, then in floating rate debt because then as six months libor keeps keeps rising their returns will start going up in in contrast if they had bought fixed rate debt they are not going to get that benefit so if they feel investors maybe feel that fixed rate uh, short term interest rates in dollars are going to rise so they are now looking for floating rate investments okay when they talk to the distribution team in the investment bank they are saying give me floating rate debt i want to buy floating rate debt for 5 years 
I want to buy floating rate US dollar date for five years. Okay, is this clear? Just a customer preference. Okay, so now what we do is so therefore what they do, this is how the swap driven issuance works. There is no investor demand. Issuer wants to issue fixed rate for five year debt, hundred million dollars. But when the distribution team talks to the investors, they find there is no demand for this kind of debt. But there is demand for floating rate debt. Okay. So what you do therefore is you do the issue as an FRN because you have to satisfy the king who is the investor. The investor wants floating rate debt. So what they do is they issue floating rate debt to satisfy the uh, investor. Okay. So uh, ABC will issue floating rate debt to satisfy the investor because and that they are happy because and they will get good pricing because there is investor demand. So if there is a, if I like an iPhone, I will pay more for an iPhone than I will for a Xiaomi or whatever it is, right? Because I have a pre although it does the same job, but I have a brand preference for iPhone. So here, if I have hunger for floating rate debt, maybe I'll be able to give the issuer good pricing on floating rate debt. Are you following? good pricing if I'm paying so much money for an iPhone that's good for Apple because they're making bigger margins so because I'm hungry for floating rate debt as an investor I am able to give the issuer very good pricing are you following okay so the issuer gets the advantage of good pricing they're able to issue at six month LIBOR maybe in a normal situation they would have had to pay 20 BP over six month LIBOR but because now there is tremendous demand for floating rate debt they are able to issue it at LIBOR flat okay so now what they do is now the investors problem is solved the investors problem is solved because he wanted floating rate debt he wanted to invest in floating rate debt once the frn has been issued he has got what he wanted he is able to invest in floating rate debt okay but the issuer's problem remains because the issuer has now been exposed he is now exposed to floating rates for five years and he does not want that he wants to have fixed rate funding so his cost of debt is all locked in are you following this yeah. okay so um, therefore his, his his he wants to have fixed rate debt so now what they do is they just do a hedge they don't disturb the underlying position the underlying position is this the frm that they have issued try to understand this from your risk management framework which you studied earlier okay so the underlying position is the floating rate liability because of the frm okay they are not happy about the net position because it is exposed to floating rates now what they do is without disturbing the underlying position you can't because you can't go back to the investor and snatch back your frn saying i don't want to issue floating rate debt you can't disturb that side so you let it be and then on a uh, on a parallel basis you set up a hedge so that your net exposure is fixed are you following what i'm saying so now you see how uh, an irs can be used to satisfy both sides so the investment bank says fine don't worry we'll give you net fixed cost of debt so you do the FRN, let's satisfy the investor, give him floating rate debt, which he wants. Let's complete the issue because this allows you to raise capital. Because remember in this figure one, there is a principal flow. The investor will invest $100 million with the issuer. So the issuer, this is a primary capital market uh, issuance. So remember what will happen, there will be fresh issue of securities and there will be net inflow to the issuer. You remember all that, which we studied in PCM? What is the difference between a secondary capital markets transaction and a primary capital market transaction? Everybody's forgotten all that. What? All of half dead now. Everybody's forgotten. What was one of the trans one of the features of the PCM transaction was that the change in the balance sheet, but what how exactly or which two accounts? The no the two accounts that are affected as securities issued okay okay or uh, and uh, so let's put it as or or inflow of funds okay inflow of funds on account of money received or paid on account of of uh, security issuance so this is clear okay so if if this we define it this way this will capture even bonus issues okay which we will have to classify because you have to classify everything as some category or the other otherwise your taxonomy is not proper okay so there is an inflow the most common way to look at it is that there is an inflow to the issuer in a pcm transaction either inflow or outflow if you do a buyback then it's an outflow but there is an inflow to the issuer inflow of funds in a secondary capital market transaction there is no inflow of funds is everyone clear there is no inflow or outflow because it's between two investors in the market they are not concerned with the the issuer is not involved in a secondary capital markets transaction so this is a pcm transaction in figure one 
Yes, it's a PCM transaction. Yes. So by satisfying the investor, what we have achieved is we have ensured that what the company needed, primary capital markets, raising of capital, the company got what it needed. It needed the funds. So there's an inflow of funds. Is this clear? Okay. Now what we do is we take care of the second problem because the issuer is still exposed to floating rate debt, which he does not want. But we don't disturb the underlying transition. We set up and we do an IRS as a hedge. Okay. So here we'll take a simplifying example that we do 100% hedge at one time itself. Okay. This is why you have swap. This is what is called swap driven issuance. Okay. So here immediately the same day within a few hours of completing the FRN issue, they will enter into a swap with SCB. Okay. So SCB standard chartered bank because I wrote this book for standard when I wrote this book I was a standard chartered so every all example is for SCB okay the SCB is a, is a well, this was written for customers of standard chartered bank so every every bank uh, all the banks are actually SCB here okay so is this clear now so typically what will happen is that the same guy will try to uh, this is one of the advantages of having a active uh, investment banking uh, presence okay that if you are able to lead manage a lot of issues when you have to do the irs transaction you can also do the you can also get the benefit of the irs transaction because remember this irs transaction the bank will make some kind of margin on this transaction because they are doing a transaction with a uh, with a retail with a corporate customer they will make some kind of profit on this transaction generally so every investment bank wants that uh, wh when it is doing primary market business it should also get all kinds of side business like if there is a foreign exchange transaction involved then i should get that transaction because i did the i lead manage the primary capital markets business because this is remember this is the most important aspect of a corporate treasury raising capital everybody is dying to raise capital okay people are willing to make all kinds of concessions for anybody who will give them money okay either you give directly as an investor or you arrange the financing as an investment bank so those investment banks which can arrange big big amounts of financing they are in high demand because everybody is hungry for money okay every corporate is hungry for money so whoever can provide finance either directly or indirectly is a big shot okay so what these guys investment banks will try to do is using their leverage so if i'm arranging a hundred million dollar frn for you i have some leverage if i'm an investment bank i have some leverage okay so now what i'll try to do is i'll try to arm twist you as the issuer because i'm saying that okay look i gave you this money i raised this money for you now you give me the foreign exchange transaction if this is let's say an indian issuer okay let's say this is video con or somebody an indian issuer issuing in the us dollar euro markets maybe he wants to sell the dollars eventually and use this fund in india in india you can't buy stuff with us dollars you will have to convert this us dollars into indian rupees so then let's say Citibank is arranging this issue is the primary markets is the investment bank then Citibank will ensure that their Bombay Treasury will get the foreign exchange transaction so the Bombay Treasury will be able to quote on 100 million dollar dollar rupee transaction so they'll make some money out of that okay then then Citibank will also try to convince the issuer that you do the IRS with me okay instead of doing it with the stand chart you do the IRS with me so then on the IRS also they'll make some money right okay so this is how the business works okay so but now get get back to the whole idea of swap driven issuance so if you do both the transactions on the same day can you see that both parties are happy now is everyone clear make sure that you satisfy yourself Imani, are you following okay all right okay so uh, please make sure you uh, understand this that here you have a ch you have satisfied if you do both the transactions on the same day within a few hours then you have satisfied both the parties is that clear to everybody as if this case is in the same country i mean they are not doing cross currency swap no they are not doing cross currency here i wanted to keep the example simple so i'm discussing it as a simple same us dollar based transaction but you can actually make this across countries also but let's understand because I don't want to overcomplicate the example. Okay, first let's understand a simple example of swap driven issuance. Okay, and then we can make it more complicated. Okay, but is that you, your question is answered? Okay, yeah. So the same system will follow in the uh, intermarket inter transactions. No, I didn't follow what you mean. Uh, what do you mean by intermarket transactions? Quiet. When one person is speaking, everyone has to be quiet. Yeah. 
Two different currencies. Yes. Okay, we'll come to that. That's a more complicated example. First, I want to make sure that all the sleepers, first period, everybody is already half asleep. Shivani, you're not feeling well. Are you not feeling well? Then you can go. I won't take. I won't cut your attendance. You want to go home? Okay. Then you just relax. You you can sleep if you're not feeling well. Just put your head down and sleep. Okay. All right. But everybody else, please make sure you're engaging in the class. Uh, you know, engaging with what is being discussed in the class, okay, so that you give yourself the best chance of remembering all the stuff. So, let's first be clear about a simple case of swap driven issuance with only one currency involved, okay. What is swap driven issuance? Here we say that this FRN issuance, this FRN issuance we say is swap driven issuance because remember, the moment we say issuance means we are referring to a PCM transaction okay the irs is not referred to doing an irs is not referred to as issuance it's just called doing an irs because there's no issuance there okay issuance is only happening in the pcm so when we say swap driven issuance here we say that this particular frn issue in the us dollar uh, capital markets this is swap driven issuance because had it not been for a favorable swap rate this guy because eventually this abc let's say abc's benchmark was i when they are talking to the origination team of the investment bank okay they are saying okay i'm willing to do this i don't want to i really want to issue fixed rate debt but if you're telling me that i can indirectly achieve a fixed rate cost of funds but you make sure that i am able to get better than six and a half percent six fixed rate because every treasury has some benchmark remember in your project financing hurdle rates remember hurdle rates npv you never heard of hurdle rates yes sir IRR has to be compared to what? <coughs> when you compare the IRR of a project, you compare it to what? Some kind of benchmark hurdle rate. And then you decide whether the project IRR, you've forgotten everything. I mean, it's just shocking. All your basics of NPV and IRR, everything you've forgotten. So every treasury, now you remember, is your memory jogged? Have, have I jogged your memory? Anybody who went jogging in the morning, maybe I should jog your memory once again. Okay. Hurdle rate. Yes, Ria has suddenly woken up. Uh, when she heard the word jogging, she suddenly woke up. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. So you remember all this stuff or no? You Maybe you should go back and check. When you do the IRR, when you calculate the IRR of a project, okay, when you calculate, what do you do? The IRR is 15%. How do you know it's good or bad? You will have some hurdle rate for investments. Maybe your hurdle rate is 12%. Then you say, okay, 15 is greater than 12. So I can accept this project. That's how it's used, right? That is one part of it. So the hurdle, so every treasury has some kind of benchmark in mind, some hurdle rate. So the treasury is telling the origination team, okay, fine. If you want me to do all this uh, roundabout way of issuing fixed rate debt by first issuing an FRN, then entering into a fixed floating IRS. I'll do it, but you make sure that I can get six and a half percent or better. That's how they're going to think. They will have some benchmarks. So they will say, okay, you do whatever you want, but I have to get a net net cost of debt should be less than six and a half percent, less than equal to. Is this point clear to everyone? Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, yes. We have to go for and we have to go for them. You have to those who have to go for interviews. Yes, the whole class has to go for interviews. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, only those who are in suits can go. Only suited, suited, booted character. Ishan cannot go. Although Ishan is the most restless. We'll have to put him, next class we'll put him in a cage. Okay, suited guys, please quickly. And don't max, minimize disruption. Where are you? Are you suited? This is your dress. Okay. <laughs> Minimize the disruption. Okay, guys, the rest of you keep concentrating. The rest of you keep concentrating. Quickly, quickly. Where are you going? You can go. How can you go for an interview like this? <laughs> okay all right okay guys let's concentrate now
okay so are you following the logic how the corporate treasury works the corporate treasury will have some kind of benchmark hurdle rate saying that okay i'm i'm happy with in the context of that hurdle rate that will come from some kind of cost of capital out of which uh, the cost of debt will be a one component of the cost of capital okay so they will have some hurdle rate for debt also they will say that i can't pay more than six and a half percent for five year fixed rate debt so you make sure so this therefore the in what the investment bank does is they look at the swap rates they look at swap rates they look at quiet here okay they look at what is the swap market because the swap market is also moving up and down it's not just staying flat it's moving up and down so they look at the swap rates they look at at what price they can issue the frn they look at the investor demand so everything is managed as one transaction effectively okay although it's two separate transactions so this is why you call it swap driven issues when citibank sees okay in this case okay so it's a standard charter when they see that they are able to issue the frn at libor flat okay the investor demand the book building shows that there is enough investor demand the libor uh, the frn will be issued at libor flat okay frn pricing will be libor flat and then they look at the irs prices if they feel that it will be below six and a half percent for five years okay then they go in and uh, lock in both the issue both the transactions this is clear they do the frn and then they lock in into an fr uh, into an irs so that abc is able to get a net cost of funding below six and a half what they wanted is everyone clear about this no no this is the function of market pr uh, prices you observe the market because the, you can't influence the irs market is very big you can't influence that market okay it's very big so you just observe market prices if you feel that market prices are below six and a half percent and they are likely to remain there then you go in for this transaction and you can able and then you are able to lock into this rate you can't influence this price you can only observe the price and when it falls below your target level then you can go in and attack is this clear okay all right so now you understand what is meant by swap driven issuance that essentially investor preferences at swap driven issuance is the presence of the irs market okay the swap market overall currency swap uh, currency cross currency irs is also one way of doing this but we take the simple example where investor demand is for one type of security for floating rate debt let's say but the issuer wants fixed rate debt okay so by using the irs you can engage in swap driven issuance here what we say this is swap driven issuance because this issue would not have happened unless the swap was also favorable are you following unless the irs rate was also favorable enough to allow abc to secure what it wanted okay this issuance would not have happened that is there is no natural uh, there is no natural issuer wanting to there's no natural supply of five year frn uh, floating rate debt that's what we mean by swap driven issuance swap driven issuance is unnatural issuance of some sort are you following what i mean what i mean by unnatural because there is no natural supply of five year debt because nobody wants to issue five year debt the issuer that is there is wants to issue fixed rate debt but it is issuing for floating rate debt because that's where the investor demand is and then immediately it, and it is only doing that because the swap rate is also favorable enough for it to achieve what it wants to achieve are you following slightly more complicated transaction but is everyone following the scheme make sure you revise it later once again and understand this concept so this gives you an understanding of capital markets i will uh, just so essentially you have to i will write up the the details a little bit more but you should understand this transaction from here itself okay so you have swap driven issuance which means that you have investor demand in a particular segment a particular type of debt for a particular type of debt but the issuer wants to issue a different type of debt and how the bank deals with the response so the bank essentially see bank this is actually a book now the now irs is a is a type of instrument okay it's a debt market uh, it follows it falls in debt as an asset class okay it's a it's a it's an instrument so in every bank treasury you will have a dealer just like you have foreign exchange dealers so you will have a market maker and irs authorized dealer uh, kind of like an authorized dealer which we use that expression we use only in india okay for foreign exchange dealers so these guys the sc stand chart will have a irs market maker okay remember when we talked about the secondary capital market and the overall market making operation as one type of operation okay the market making operation is one type of operation so in that you have all kinds of markets and instruments 
because you have spot forward futures options and then you have currencies commodities equities debt okay so in all of these uh, boxes you will have market making so there will be one uh, in which falls under the column swaps and the row will be debt the row i'm just going back to that framework okay where we have asset classes markets and instruments so the column will be swaps and the row will be debt because these are irs uh, transactions so in standard treasury there will be a desk which is making markets in dollar irs another desk which is making markets in sterling irs so that guy is running a active risk book or a passive risk book active, active risk book okay so he's a market maker he's a class of speculator he's running an active risk book so that guy will have basically some one guy will come abc will come and pay on a irs here to that guy this is scb there's an interest rate swap de uh, desk okay which is dealing with the transaction then maybe after a few hours bank of america comes and receives on an irs for five years so that guy has since he's market making he's there in the market so people are he's quoting two-way prices okay so people are hitting him on the bid and offer like any other market maker so his position is constantly changing so he will keep a track of his net position and he will see where he is and he will take a view on market rates and he will decide whether he wants to square his position or not. Is this clear? So that's how that risk is managed. So that trader will have to manage that risk and he will have his own risk limits and all those. So that's why the risk management guys will come in from the middle office. Remember middle office? So the trader is sitting in the front office. The market maker is sitting in the front office. In the middle office, okay, we have put the risk management guys. That guy will come in and say, look at your exposure is exceeding the risk limit. You better cut down your positions. Okay, that kind of exchange is going to happen between these guys. Okay, so this is how this risk is managed. Yeah, that's a currency swap. That would be a currency swap. Okay, that will typically be a currency swap. In an interest rate swap, you would not exchange. In a simple single currency interest rate swap, we have to study swaps also as a separate instrument. But I introduced at least one type of swap here to understand this concept of swap driven issuance as part of your debt capital markets discussion. So that if you want to read up, you can read up this book. You will find a discussion, a detailed discussion about currency swaps also in this uh, transaction. In this, uh, So that what you're talking about, that is currency swap with exchange with initial exchange of principle. Sir, uh, I was asking that in that case, the bank, has, uh, the bank does not take the risk of I mean, fluctuations. No, the bank may or may not see that whether the bank will take the risk or not take the risk or match it off with another transaction offsetting transaction in the market. That is the decision of the swap dealer. That is a decision of the swap dealer on the market making desk. If he feels if his view is that market prices will move in his favor, he may keep the position for a while. So whether or not the bank will square the position immediately okay, in the market or keep the position that is a decision to be made by the swap dealer on the irs desk and he is responsible for his decisions so if he loses money then he has to you know be accountable for that okay so i can see people are getting restless so let's look at the time okay so we'll let you go so our coverage is very slow but at the very least we should make sure that even with this coverage people are not able to i think follow everything that is being discussed okay so please engage in the class and 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 uh, and uh, okay so tomorrow next class is unless you can change it with Lalita if it's your problem whatever you want to do what Viber wanted to do okay so whatever you do please let me know also and uh, follow those rules no 9 30 class on Saturday or Sunday but uh, and no double class on one day okay 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 you can go Thank you.